Welcome to this event, Unlocking the Potential of Biocontrol, co-organized by the International Biocontrol Manufacturers Association Global and France and the Institute for European Environment Policy. The event is live streamed in both French and English. So good morning, good afternoon to you all. My name is Joanna. I'm moderating today's discussion. I'm a 30 year veteran of EU food and agriculture policy and a strong advocate of the ecological transition. So I'm particularly pleased to be invited. My personal philosophy is to bring EU policy closer to people. And so here on today's topic, many care deeply about food and nature. Farmers, communities, families have a real stake in this discussion, how to ensure success of the European Green Deal and the farm to fork and how to bring a swift transition to ecological farming. So when moderating last European Commission farm to fork conference last year, what struck me was the unity among stakeholders for a swift transition, but also the global imperative, the global challenges for climate, nature and water and health are, are stark. And the message was loud and clear there's no time to waste on getting the transition done. Unlocking the potential of biocontrol is part of the solution. So about biocontrol, biocontrol is a biological pest control that works in harmony with nature. So farming becomes more resilient. Biocontrol is essential to food system change and to biology first IPM. That's integrated pest management. So both the EU farm to fork and biodiversity strategies will allow Europe to be more resilient in terms of food security. But while biocontrol is a nature-based alternative to chemical pesticides, it's regulated under EU pesticides legislation. EU law was not designed for biocontrol. So this regulatory mismatch creates disproportionate problems for the sector and for farmers. Now there's hope. With revision of the SUD, the Sustainable Use Directive on the horizon, we now have an opportunity to overcome decades of barriers to biocontrol and pave the way for a new regulatory paradigm where EU legislation helps unlock the potential of biocontrol towards biology first farming. And let's not forget, climate change and nature loss are at critical levels as reported in the recent UN climate report. Last year, the UN held three critical summits on biodiversity, climate and food systems. At the same time, demand for plant-based foods is growing. So today, in the next one and a half hours, together with our eminent lineup of speakers from Paris and Brussels, we will discuss three questions. First, how can EU regulation best facilitate widespread use of biocontrol, starting with SUD reform? Second, what are the regulatory constraints and solutions for biocontrol as a game changer for a sustainable food and farming system? And what is the role of EU policy instruments in the transition? In particular, the role of biocontrol in increasing availability and affordability of sustainable food options. Policymakers now start to recognize that biocontrol is essential to achieving the Green Deal objectives for nature climate and sustainable food systems. In a moment, we're going to hear from the European Commission, but first, let's listen to our opening speech from the European Parliament, from a member of the European Parliament, Jeremy Desserlet. Jeremy, over to you, welcome. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me in this debate, this webinar, on a topic that is indeed very relevant. I have five minutes and I don't want to bore you too much, so I will be quite quick, but I wanted to start by saying that we are lucky here in Europe to have um, farming and a food system relying on rules, regulations, whether it is uh, for the environment or animal welfare, the highest regulations in the world. So that's a richness that others don't have and that can allow us to be more performant than ever. If we come to the farm to fork strategy, 
And between us, we've only, if we call it strategy, it is a bit lacking in terms of action plan and uh, accompanying plans. So it's barely a strategy yet. That being said, the ambition of Farm to Fork is to conciliate sustainability and resilience of our farming system in the EU. It is a real challenge. It means that we have to reach environmental targets that are ambitious without questioning too much our productivity. So uh, the challenge here is uh, the food sovereignty and unfortunately current events is, uh, are, are really um, underlining that. And it also goes hand in hand with less dependency. Some of the figures and the targets uh, in figures for farm to fork, for example, reduction of 50% of the use of pesticides seem too ambitious for some. What is sure, is that uh, we won't reach them if we don't give alternative means to farmers. And so we have to keep in mind that setting ambitious targets is not a bad idea, but if we don't complete them with the proper means to reach them, well, it's more complicated, of course. Of course, obviously, biocontrol is part of those alternatives. So, of course, we have to work on that. I know that you are worried um, about the delay of uh, the publication of the Commission and the uh, revision of uh, SUD, so the um, Directive on Sustainable Use of Pesticides. But if it had been published last week, it probably wouldn't have been heard too much, given the context and the debates within the parliament and the other institutions on the topic of food safety. But the objectives of farm to fork are not questioned. And the proposal will come out, of course, and it should contribute to leading the way to uh, going to a reduction of the use of pesticides. And for that, we have to support farmers in reaching their targets, specifically in the use of tools and biocontrol tools that are key for the ecological transition. Farming plays a fundamental role in our society and we have to make sure it stays resilient and able to face crises and to guarantee food security in the long term. And once again, biocontrol can contribute directly to those objectives. A few words more for member states to make sure that they can develop the use of biocontrols. We have to have a legal... Uh, revision and the revision of the SUD will help us reach that and it will give us more clarity and ease uh, on the access to all the public supports we can have on that topic. So I come from France and in my country, of course, we are moving forward in that topic and I'm glad to see that. I'm also glad to see I'm looking forward to making that topic more European, to make sure that within the Parliament, within the European Commission, we can also move forward on that topic. So that's more or less what I wanted to say as an introduction. And please do not underestimate the will of farmers to go towards those processes, those innovations that are absolutely necessary to reach our environmental ambi ambitions that are quite ambitious and justified, but also quite ambitious. Thank you. Um, we have a, a strong lineup of guests from, uh, from France um, in, in the meeting today. So um, thank you to you. That was a very important uh, stage setting, scene setting on the topic. Now we're going to listen by video to Professor Benoit Grimontpré from the Poitiers uh, University, um, and he's going to share with us uh, his legal um, perspective on the injustice, the legal injustice to nature-based solutions. So bear with us. Um, the video is coming now.
Bonjour à tous, Benoît Grimont, Good afternoon, everybody. Benoît Grimont, Pré, I'm a professor of law at the University of Poitiers, specializing in law and environmental law. First of all, I would like to apologize for not being able to join you today, at least not live, to talk de ce sujet. about this topic. Il été en tant que mm, so I was asked as a lawyer to uh, analyze uh, les, les the lock-ins, uh, the legal lock-ins and des, regulatory lock-ins to developing uh, de natural solutions to protect plants. So dire que first of all, I have to say that to reduce the overall use of pesticides in Europe, we have to find alternative solutions for crop protection. Those alternatives are often analyzed from a biotechnical point of view, which is quite normal and already complicated. But it appears that there are also regulatory barriers to their development. And those barriers have been uh, pointed out in various reports, uh, whether in France or at European level. On this very recent topic of alternatives, we realized that uh, the law is quite technical but it's not quite ready yet to uh, treat them globally, comprehensively, and it's been built case by case without a global vision. So to stay brief, I will um, articulate my, my speech in two uh, parts. First, what are the barriers to developing natural solutions? And then what renovations of law, of biocontrol at a European level could we um, consider? So first of all, on the current obstacles, when we talk about natural solutions, what solutions are we really talking about? From a legal standpoint, indeed, there are multiple categories of products or alternative solutions. There are products authorized in organic farming. In France, there are uh, natural preparations of low concern. There are biocontrol solutions. There are low risk products, basic substances defined in European regulations. And the problem is that there is a different legal treatment for each of those alternatives. So this is already quite complex. If we focus on biocontrol itself, since this is the angle today, so we realize that its recognition is only national in France. So there is a regulation that is specific to a member state. This means that what is valid for France is not valid for the Euro other European states and vice versa. And that can lead to distortions of competition on the market for those products. Then we also realize that uh, natural substances and microorganisms are treated as pesticides, but also as classic conventional pesticides. Their marketing is subject to the same processes and criteria as chemical pesticides, namely the criteria of harmlessness for health and the environment and the criteria of effectiveness of those solutions. There is currently no specific arrangement in the text for the um, marketing of these solutions. Then when we look at the stage of product use, at the stage of uh, inter integrated crop protection, Biocontrol is not highlighted, it's not uh, um, put under the spotlight compared to other types of solutions. So currently, from a legal standpoint, what we notice is a lack of visibility of biocontrol when compared to other types of alternatives. There's a regulatory complexity that is quite hard on uh, the stakeholders and the procedures are thought only for chemical substances and are not uh, fit for purpose for natural solutions. So what solutions, what legal solutions are there for these more natural solutions? So this is the second part of my uh, reflection here. I think we could consider um, a renovation of law on biocontrol, but at European level. So a general idea here would be to forge a European legal framework for alternative solutions. The first step in this uh, reasoning would be first to uh, get to a harmonized definition of biocontrol solutions at European level. So we would get one definition, one concept valid for all the mechanisms, all the biocontrol mechanisms in all member states. 
So this is already a step forward, which is supported by France and which was concretized in the project of reform of the third directive, SUD, which uh, I was able to read and which, as you know, has been postponed indefinitely. So here we already have a first step that could easily be taken, which is to recognize biocontrol at European level. But this step is in itself insufficient and the draft reform of the directive was in itself very insufficient. Why? Well, because it did not draw any lessons from that unified concept of biocontrol on the legal regime. So for the moment, no European text considers treating biocontrol solutions differently from today. However, it seems to me that there are various projects that it would be imperative to start. First of all, building procedures for uh, placing biocontrol solutions on the market, procedures that would be more fit for purpose, simpler, shorter, and um, we could have a different conception of the criteria of effectiveness in relation to these biocontrol solutions compared to chemical solutions. Then the idea would be to uh, give biocontrol a real place in the general crop production system, which is not the case today in the text. What would it mean? Well, first of all, it would mean uh, officially recognized uh, alternative solutions should be used. They should be used in the comparative assessment of chemical substances when we consider registering them or re-registering them. So that's the first point. And then second point, give priority to biocontrols also in the framework of the principle of integrated uh, pest management. If we reform the directive on the sustainable, sustainable use of pesticides, we will promote integrated pest management, IPM. And in that framework, biocontrol should have an official place. So we could envisage a few examples like uh, priority um, for biocontrol for the protection of crops in so-called protected areas. We could also um, um, see biocontrol in organic farming and not just products authorized in organic farming. We could envisage its place in um, uh, a plant health advice. Uh, we could also envisage, envisage it in the specs of product quality signs, and why not also make room for biocontrol in the national strategic plans that the states have developed, in particular to set up the eco schemes of the future CAP, CAP. So these are all the legal considerations that I wanted to bring to your attention on this subject. Thank you, Professor Benoit. Grimont Pré, uh, very informative. Now we've had the political and legal perspective. Let's hear from our panelists in Brussels and Paris on the question, how to unlock legal constraints to widespread biocontrol deployment. You can put your questions to the panelists in the top right hand corner of the streaming page. So um, let's bring up now the panelists. Um, let me introduce you to our first panelist. So European Commission Director of DG Sante, Mrs. Uh, Maria Pilar Aguar Fernandez. Um, we have the Secretary General of IBMA, uh, International Biocontrol Manufacturers uh, of France, Denis uh, Longevial. We have the Institute for European Environment Policy External Impact Director, Faustine Bass de Fossé and uh, MEP uh, de Serlet, who is staying with us for the whole program. Um, audience, uh, welcome to you. Apologies for those who've had a little tricky technical difficulties getting on, but hope you're all there now. Um, if not, you're watching um, after this event, but those who are watching live, feel free to ask questions, uh, type your questions into the Q&A box. You know how that works on the top right of your screen and um, the most popular and some additional questions that we'll have in through our other channels, Facebook and so forth, um, we will get to those. Um, so turning directly to Director of DG Sante, Maria Pilar Agua of the European Commission. Um, while you cannot, of course, comment on the uh, SUD leaks uh, and you cannot disclose the content of the legislative <laughs> proposals, can you share with us um, what is the general direction and thinking within the European Commission? 
Um, over to you, uh, Peter. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci énormément aussi. Thank uh, you very much and thank you for thank you to the MEPs and thank you to Professor Grimont Pre for uh, the few words they already said and for the introductions. And I see there's not a huge difference between uh, what he wants to see and uh, the vision the Commission has. So as uh, I am not a French native speaker and uh, my French is even worse than my English, I will now switch to English if you allow me, but uh, I just wanted to uh, say a few words in French, given uh, the big French presence here. So uh, thank you very much again for this invitation. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here today. It is a different pleasure, I have to confess, okay? Uh, plans, life is not uh, exactly what we planned. And uh, well, there are, uh, uh, we have to acknowledge that things happen. So, but let me start by saying that from the very, very beginning of this mandate, uh, the European Commission has been championing the major uh, uh, objective of this commission, the European Green Deal. Um, we wanted, we believe, and we still want, and believe it is possible to make Europe the first climate neutral continent. This is something that uh, is, it was in our dreams and we still think it is achievable. And for this, at the very heart, we need to have the uh, biodiversity and the farm to fork strategies. I um, have heard uh, the honorable member of the parliament saying that the farm to fork strategy is still work in progress. And yes, it's still work in progress. We do agree on that. But at the end of the day, uh, life is work always in progress. So, but anyway, the point is in these two uh, in these strategies, there were a set of targets which are very much of uh, relevance for, for today's meeting, for today's discussion for this event. So we wanted to um, have the uh, use of chemical pesticides. Uh, and uh, we also particularly had a second target on halving the use of the more hazardous uh, pesticides, all of these by 2030. And that cannot be achieved without um, alternatives. That's a fact. So there are, we need to put in place the right environment, the right landscape and the right tools to make this happen. Our vision for Europe, it's a new food system in which sustainability is at the beginning. So it's the starting point, but it's also at the end. So it's the goal we want to achieve and uh, uh, reducing chemical pesticides is absolutely a must. It is an intrinsic part of this vision. Um, well, as I have just mentioned, life happens and Russian war in Ukraine is reconfiguring everything that we were doing in the world. Uh, I mean, in, in not only in the sustainable use of pesticides, but all around us. You have seen how uh, some priorities have shifted and some uh, urgencies have to obviously had to be taken into consideration at the very immediate uh, point. So it is obvious that this uh, disgression on in Ukraine has had a negative impact uh, on, on the food and the farmers. And um, there was a very important call for immediate short term measures. Um, so it has been one of the one of the elements that as mentioned has happened is that the revision of the suit it's going to be uh then uh let's say adopted in a few uh months it's it's postponed but it's not abandoned and i would like to say postpone but only very very shortly postponed because what the crisis had made abundantly clear is that we need a food system in Europe that is resilient. We need that the resilience of our food systems have uh, has uh, basically uh, it's a long term uh, goal. It's a long term objective and it's a long term um, intrinsic feature. So for these, we actually need to reorient the way we understand today the agriculture and, and the food systems, the whole chain, and uh, make sure that we build in security and sustainability. 
We cannot continue uh, relying heavily on inputs such as pesticides. We need to change this model and make sure that we reduce this reliance uh, through innovation, through agroecology and adoption of best practices. We definitely have to adapt to the landscape of today, but we will stay in course. It is uh, today's event would have been different if the presentation of the sewer revision of the sewer would have been presented last uh, Wednesday as it was expand, uh, expected. But you can understand that at this stage, and um, most unfortunately, I can't really uh, comment on, on a number of details. Nevertheless, I would really like to uh, uh, give you as much possible as the flavor, as the general things that you may expect in there. And let me finish by saying that the, uh, the objectives are actually haven't changed. The objectives of this new revision is, uh, are the same as the current legislation. So at the end of the day, what we want by this is to protect the biodiversity, to protect the environment and to protect the human health by reducing the reuse and the risk of the chemical pesticides across Europe. I think I'll stop here today now and I'll leave in, uh, perhaps uh, space for the other uh, speakers so we can have then a conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pilar. Very insightful. And of course, um, I'm sure the audience is asking lots of questions and thinking about, um, and we're going to come back to you, of course, in the debate. Um, so thank you so much for your very uh, frank um, uh, intervention. So turning and now to one of the organizers of this event um, from the Institute for European Environment Policy, we have the external impact director, Faustine Bas de Fossé, and she will share her thoughts on the benefits of biocontrol to climate, nature and soil. Faustine, um, how does biocontrol contribute to the EU Farm to Fork? Over to you. Thank you, Joanna. And thanks everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, yes, I have a couple of slides. I think I'm the only one in the panel, but I don't have too many. I only have four. So uh, be reassured that uh, I will try to stick to uh, the time that is uh, given to me. But I would like to start first uh, with a statement uh, from the former UN chief for climate, uh, who, when the latest IPCC report assessment got published last February, said uh, the future is in the decisions that we take today. And the sixth assessment report from APCC indeed came out as a brutal and unequivocal, and yet another one, call for urgent action. It was also for the first time that the IPCC recognized strongly the interdependency between climate, ecosystems, biodiversity, and human society. And I must say that in light of this uh, urgent call for action, it is concerning to hear claims and attempts in the context of the war in Ukraine to delay the European Green Deal farm to fork uh, agenda implementation. Because as it was said also by the previous speaker from the European Commission, the European Green Deal is our unique compass today. And especially now in these very highly turbulent times that we are going through. And the resilience of our food system is actually encored within its sustainability. And the proper implementation of the farm to fork is actually among the immediate solutions to the crisis like the one that we're going through today. And it is actually through the prism of the uh, European Green Deal that we did assess uh, for IBMA last year, the potential of biocontrol and its benefits. It was made through a literature review of uh, existing scientific articles uh, in peer reviewed journals, but also uh, um, a review of existing legislative framework and EU research projects. Uh, the main outcome from our study, from our literature review, was that biocontrol is a key enabler for the European Green Deal implementation, and in particular, the farm to fork strategy, but not only. So if we look at the benefits in particular, next slide, please. Our report finds that biocontrol has the potential to support the protection and enhancement of biodiversity. It also finds strong benefits for soil quality and health, but also for human health. 
And we also went further than the direct benefits of, that, of biocontrol. And we identified also what other impacts we could find in the literature, such as the ones on farm economics, climate, and governance. Next slides, please. Now more in details. What did we find on soil, for instance? So first, the reviewed studies <clears throat> indicated that benefits of biocontrol are both to be found in decreasing chemicals reaching the soil, but also in creating favorable states for microbes. On biodiversity, we found from the literature that biocontrol lowers the pressure resulting from chemical inputs. It respects non-targeted insects organisms and leaves no toxic residues in the soil. But what's also interesting is that biocontrol helps fostering systemic approaches to farming. And it tends to foster, for instance, the use of bi um, biodiversity corridors, such as ecological focus areas on farmlands, because indeed, uh, this tends to increase the effectiveness of natural enemies. So farmers are encouraged to actually increase uh, the percentage of ecological focus areas on their land when deploying biocontrol. On human health, the benefits of biocontrol on human health is at pri primary production stage first, when farmers and field workers do not have to handle toxic products, but also at later stage in food production process as it drastically reduces the level of chemical residues in food. Now looking at the wider impacts, on climate, we actually search for climate uh, impacts of biocontrol. And I must say here that <clears throat> Actually, we found very little in the literature, and that's one of the recommendations that we make, that there should be further research on the interaction between uh, biocontrol and climate change mitigation. But we did find that at the production stage, biocontrol can help reduce emissions as, alternative to chem as an alternative to chemical inputs, which chemical inputs do account for five to 6% of emissions worldwide. At the level of the farm emissions reduction might also occur as biocontrol might require less energy and fossil fuels to be deployed because using traps or insects uh, is less energy intensive than using machinery and spraying uh, chem chemical inputs. And this is actually particularly relevant in the context of the crisis now that we see in the war in Ukraine and the need to reduce energy uses and to be less dependent on energy from, uh, from Russia. Now on farm economics, again, uh, the literature is very limited on the influence on farm income and wider economic impact. That being said, we did find some studies that did point out the increased returns for farmers following the reduction in number of pesticide application and pesticide costs. And we also found uh, an interesting study that found considerably higher benefit cost ratio in favor of biocontrol when compared with no biocontrol scenarios. And last but not least, our report also found out that the use of biocontrol requires farmers to consider the whole farm approaches, so systemic approach to farming, and to understand the dynamics of life in the ecosystem in a more holistic way. And at the level of government in particular, regional or national, biocontrol does uh, help pave the way for the widespread adoption of IPM techniques, but also organic agriculture and agroecological farming. Now, next slide, please. So um, now looking at these benefits and these impacts in light of the European Green Deal objectives, <clears throat> what, we can, uh, what we did say and did conclude in our study was that uh, biocontrol can actually help achieve several objectives from the European Green Deal. On the farm to fork ones in particular, so the 50% less chemical pesticides used and organic farming on 25% farmland, that is quite straightforward. But also the one from the biodiversity strategy, that 10% of agriculture area to be devoted to high diversity in landscape features, but also that there are pollution strategy with the 75% uh, of soils healthy uh, um, objective. So now last slide. And now we'll echo uh, some of the recommendations that were made before, notably by uh, Mr. Benoit Grimontré. Uh, we made uh, five key recommendations uh, at the end of our report uh, to unlock the potential of biocontrol. So first, there is a need for an EU definition, but I think that this is somewhat shared among the speakers uh, already, at least from the first one. 
Um, the other uh, uh, recommendation that we made was that the current legal framework, and again, that was said also before by Benoit Grimontré, addressing pest control can be regarded as incomplete and maladapted to biocontrol, as it was originally designed for approving or rejecting uh, products potentially toxic to living organisms. Um, and for safe residuous levels in food, but not made for biocontrol in the first place. So a differentiated process should be considered. The CAP strategic plans should play a key role in the adoption and increased uptake of biocontrol through the eco scheme notably, but also advisory services. And we should not uh, underestimate the importance of advisory services also in the CAP. And I must say here that the latest uh, announcement or statement from the Commissioner for Agriculture, Voshikovsky, on the CAP strategic plans uh, that the Commission has seen so far was a bit concerning because apparently the level of environmental ambition was not uh, very high. And um, in, in particular, in light of the 25% target for uh, organic. More research beyond technical issues are needed, looking at wider impacts, as I said, on climate in particular, uh, the impacts of climate on climate of biocontrol. And last but not least, we also need uh, to move from projects uh, and uh, targeted approach to all field applications. Large scale application indeed will help show the actual potential of biocontrol. Now we'll stop here. Thanks a lot and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Faustine. Crystal clear as always. Um, we're going to swiftly move to a uh, second co organizer of this event from uh, IBMA France, uh, Secretary General Denis Langevial, who will reflect um, on what's happening in France, the benefits um, to farmers from biocontrol, the lessons learned from French legislation. Denis, in France, uh, how does the legislation contribute to uh, wider use of biocontrol and with what results? Thank you, Joe. Hello, everyone. So, indeed, I would very briefly like to talk about, well, the French example, even though, mm, well, because of the uh, different public policies indeed allowed to uh, improving the development of biocontrol. I have five key points I would like to share with you very briefly. Let me talk about how well biocontrol was recognized by France. Then I will talk about the role of public policies in favor of research and investments on biocontrol, still in France. Thirdly, I will explain how public policies uh, make different stakeholders well taking part in developing biocontrol in France and beyond uh, through public policies, because indeed public policies have an impact and allow people to co-develop biocontrol. And finally, I will talk well about the public policies which uh, adopt private practices in favor of biocontrol. But uh, I'll dig into details later on. So first point, recognizing biocontrol in France. Biocontrol has officially been recognized in France 11 years ago only. It has been identified as a key point of agroecology. It is a priority of uh, a national plan we have in favor of well, uh, sustainable use of uh, chemical inputs. And since 2014, biocontrol has an official definition, which is in the uh, law on rural areas in France. This definition has been put into place in October 2014. And furthermore, when this definition was adopted back in the day, well, ME MPs in France took different measures uh, from there on, well, to adopt rules uh, in favor of biocontrol and its development. For example, one example only amongst the first measures which were taken back in the day, well, a decision was made and the state has to make sure that the evaluation and authorization processes uh, for biocontrol products on the market in France, France needed to be accelerated. And after this text was adopted, some um, 
further explanations were given so that well uh, more products could be put on the market easier and faster furthermore the pace mm, increased later on thanks to other measures namely well in october 2018 mps adopted uh, the ecofito plan and a national strategy to develop uh, biocontrol nationally. So this is the framework which allowed well, to recognize bio biocontrol in France. And as I have said, biocontrol is a key and priority sector for research and investments thanks to the public policies at national level in France. In 2015, the Agriculture Innovation 2025 plan uh, puts some priorities forward for the research in agriculture in France for the, the 10 years time. And biocontrol is part of the priority sectors of this Agriculture Innovation Plan 2025. Secondly, in 2021, very recently, well, biocontrol was mm, made one of the key sectors for investments in France. It is part of the recovery plan and investments for future plan in France. And several hundreds of millions have been earmarked for mm, different sectors, amongst which uh, biocontrol. All of this to say that biocontrol is a priority for research and investments in our country. Thirdly, public policies make partners mm, being well part of this development. Let me give you a few examples. And let me talk about the last decade. In October 2012, a first framework agreement in favor of de developing uh, biocontrol was signed between ministers and partners with this plan and 22 professional organizations committed themselves to deploying biocontrol. As you can see, we have texts, we have laws, we have public policies in favor of biocontrol and these laws uh, make different stakeholders also commit themselves to developing biocontrol. And this was already in 2012. Then in 2015, government uh, promoted uh, the creation of a private-public consortium on biocontrol and organizations mm, represented uh, companies in biocontrol, uh, universities, technical institutions and many other stakeholders in order well, to accelerate investigation on biocontrol. In 2016, one year later, the government experimented uh, an unprecedented mechanism for uh, certificates to limit the use of uh, phytosanitary products, CEEP certificates in France. And thanks to these certificates, distributors of such substances mm, well promoted actions which would contribute to reducing the use of chemicals conventional chemicals and they as a consequence also promoted biocontrol and today biocontrol is one of the first levers triggered by these stakeholders then well on promoting actions from stakeholders in order in favor of biocontrol in 2020 the government published the national strategy to deploy biocontrol this strategy uh, is a five years time strategy. It's based on four axes and has 34 targets. And one key element there, which aims at accelerating the adoption of biocontrol, mm, is well to make all stakeholders well carry their can on biocontrol. What's more? All partners are encouraged to uh, de deploying biocontrol. And finally, very briefly, let me say that public policies also inspire private uh, actions. In 2017, 40 uh, professional organizations 
uh, met to launch a solution contract, as we call them in France, to develop pathways to protect plants and crops. And as a consequence, trade unions, uh, stakeholders from municipalities, from companies, technical institutions, and organizations which bring solutions were gathered to develop a private initiative uh, and so that hand in hand all would be mobilized to develop alternative and innovative solutions such as biocontrol in a given area with as many farmers as possible. Final example now amongst the well innovations in the 2010s uh, some specs for private companies have been developed so that uh, bridges would be built between conventional and organic uh, agriculture with sustainable and uh, agroecological practices so that and their biocontrol was identified as a, a, suc a, a, a key element in favor of success. As you may have understood, well, public policies inspire private stakeholders and in initiatives from the private sector also feed in public policies and all of this uh, contributes to a virtuous circle in favor of biocontrol and all of this has been made possible thanks to one clear definition for biocontrol in France. And we hope this example will inspire Europe and that, well, Europe will have a clear definition for biocontrol. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. We've got some uh, questions now. Let's uh, bring all the panelists back on. Um, I'm going to read a couple of questions here, and I think they're for uh, Prince of Please to start with the uh, European Commission to Pilar. A question from A.D. Wildner. What exactly will happen by June 30th, 2022, while France holds the presidency of the Council of the EU to define and promote biological crop protection? Um, that's one question. I'm going to add to that because I can see in the, um, the questions uh, something specific. I mean, it kind of comes to the wider question. Um, what, you know, how will the SUD revision be supported by other EU regulatory instruments to ensure access to biocontrol for every farmer? Um, I mean, another of the questions which fits into the same kind of frame, which is um, the current timelines for registration of biocontrol technologies is the same as chemicals. Well, um, so that's six to eight years until solutions are available to the farmer. So is there a plan to provide a kind of fast track for biological um, uh, control agents, technologies in order to deliver on the farm to fork and biodiversity strategies? Pilar, a big question um, for you. It's a lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> I mean, it's very complex, but uh, let me try to address them all. And if I leave something, just basically come back to me. Um, so a number of things have been cited uh, by mm, some of the previous speakers. And uh, for example, um, and you have mentioned them also in your questions, the lack of definition that we have today, and also the fact that the evaluation process for uh, so uh, biocontrol substances, let me use the term in a broad context, is is perhaps suboptimal. So, and uh, and and how, as it was mentioned as well for the, by the first speaker, how to operate make operation <laughs> a strategy. Uh, how can uh, a strategy be uh, divided into, you know, tactics or actions that make it happen? I think at the end of the day, many of the questions you have put to me are on this. Well, you understand, and I've said it before, I'll say it again, I can't comment on the details of the proposal, but it is true that many of the um, we have been actively listening to all stakeholders and a number of stakeholders have flagged the, uh, the uh, deed for this definition, the biocontrol definition. They've been very keen. It's not only the people who are uh, today in the audience, but a number of, of, of uh, stakeholders from very diverse background have mentioned that. And I think that, again, I can't comment exactly on the con on content of that, but it wouldn't be a surprise that something like this, uh, as mentioned, we have 
been attentively listened to this, that we have been you know, reflecting on this matter and that might be an area where we could have uh, uh, listened to, to some of the voices. With regards of the uh, evaluation processes, that's a different story, and that I also have to say that it's not part of SUR. Okay, uh, the, the sustainable use is just part, is just small, maybe not small, a piece of legislation in a very broad and very large environment, and it's a complex environment as well, legislative environment. Well, there are other pieces that are playing their own part. So with regards of the um, how to make alternatives easier or more available or easier, faster, uh, reaching faster the, the market. We have been active on that corner too. That's not exactly should, but I am, of course, happy to share that part with all of you because uh, there have been uh, legislative proposals by the Commission that have been presented in uh, at the beginning of this year, well received, I must say, by the Parliament and the Member States state where we have actually tried to address this point, how, how uh, the requirements for new data, the requirements for approval and assessment of these, how can these, uh, you know, be basically better tailored to the substances that we're talking about. So the proposals are there, there is work in progress, and uh, we hope, hope that they are going to be soon adopted, soon in commission terms, meaning this year, right? Uh, but then I also would like to perhaps invite you all to um, to play your role, uh, because it's not only the Commission in uh, playing in, the, in in this game. Uh, so member states need to ensure that they put sufficient me measures and and resources and and willingness to in place to make sure that these uh, potential uh, alternatives really are um, these, these applications are processed rapidly and these new products uh, reach the market very soon. So um, I'm not asking you to lobby your member states, but somehow this also is, it's an area where we need other players to be active in that, in that game or in this game. So again, the more we can work on that area collectively, the better it will be for everybody. And this is a plea I want to bring to, to you all, because as I say, perhaps member states have a very more important play to, uh, role to play at this moment. So that's for the a evaluation process that was part of the question and then how can we support it from uh, with with other means and other um, elements so it has been mentioned also again that uh, the um, the cap or the pack depending on who you talk to so the new pack uh, has radically changed and the idea was to bring it really closer, bring suit closer to CAP and make sure that this new CAP provided the tools for farmers to really adopt more sustainable farming practices. That is a willingness that has been reflected both in our proposal, but also in the CAP. And as you know, at this moment, the member states uh, uh, have, well, at the, at the end of, of last year, beginning of this year, member states have um, sent uh, to the commission their new CAP national strategic plans where they needed indeed to make sure, I mean, make reference, make or state what are their plans with regards of um, a range of policies, okay, related all to sustainable farming practices and, and so on. So indeed, uh, the commission is now um, assessing uh, these plans assessing how the member states have said they are going to use the CAP instruments to reduce the use of, uh, uh, of uh, the risk of pesticides and, and in general, how these synergies between the SUD and the, uh, the CAP will work. Uh, so this work is in progress. We are uh, deeply involved in, in checking that I have heard one of the previous speakers that said that indeed it was worrying for, I think it was for her to hear that uh, uh, Commissioner Wojciechowski saying that the CAP plans 
are uh, perhaps not as ambitious as we were hoping to see, um, well, member states will receive these comments uh, to the cap plans uh, pretty soon. It is, it's just work in progress. And with uh, regards of organic farming, I think that indeed they are, we are hoping that member states make the best possible use of all these elements. Uh, and that's including also the alternative to chemical pesticides. So there are movements bringing all the things together. There are actions in other corners of this very complex uh, landscape of pesticides that we hope that really bring all together uh, for uh, to accomplish what we really want, which is uh, more sustainable, uh, better farming practice and uh, more resilient farming and food systems. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much, Pilar. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to bring back MEP uh, Desserlet at this point. Um, what is the, is the parliament um, united around this um, need to shift to sustainable agriculture and what kind of leverage can the parliament have over these uh, member state um, action plans, the strategic plans under, under the cap? Um, um, is the parliament pushing member states uh, as far as they can? Monsieur de Cerdé. Merci. Uh, Thank you. So indeed, the European Parliament has many exchanges with the Commission uh, on this, and each and every time we meet, in, well, the Commission gives us updates on the different analysis, and this, well, already allows us, well, to, uh, without uh, stepping um, on on the uh, well without uh, going too far too too far away on what uh, the commission has to do well this allows us well to uh, share our position then what i want to say uh, on well uh, all of this is that we need to think to be pragmatic on all of this and all policies whether the, we are talking about the green deal or well, the far, far to far, f farm to fork strategy of the CAP, well, all of this needs to be built together. And we cannot ask the common agricultural policy to uh, face all the challenges by itself. At one point or another, the farm to fork strategy will have to bring means which will then, one way or another, through PAC, will go to the farmers. And we truly need to keep in mind the fact that if we don't have means at the levels of our ambitions for the environment, well, then in the end we need to mm, to lose. On both sides, and then during the negotiations, during the trilogues, there has been quite a debate to know if we would talk about well the compa compatibility between. Uh, uh, CAP or and other instruments, or whether we would talk about uh, some uh, coherence. And actually, in the end, I think it is better uh, to ask CAP to contribute to uh, the Green Deal, and then maybe the Common Agricultural Policy will ask Farm to Fork strategy for for means, and then the Farm to Fork strategy could in the end also ask farmers through the policies which support them uh, to have more changes and then as i have already said let's be aware of the fact that we are already the best in class on uh, farming environment uh, in europe we are the best in class in europe on farming and on environment and also on animal welfare. So let's be proud of this and let's keep this in mind when we try to make progress because many progress has been made in farming over the last 30 years. And I think that although there are risks uh, for the environment and there are challenges, we tend to forget all the progress which has been achieved and we tend to forget that a transition is already 
uh, happening now and that we just need more support on these topics. But the European Parliament, with uh, the transparency we have on the national plans, is, well, nowadays also uh, triggering levers and has a voice which is heard. Thank you. Faustine and Denis, in the interest of time, we're going to keep your answers until the, uh, the, de the, the second discussion a little bit later. We're going to go straight to hear about this progress um, by uh, a French farmer, Edouard Billard from ur et loire uh, Chartres. We're going to watch a small video from him. Biocontrôles aujourd'hui qui sont utilisés so sur l'exploitation. Euh, avec mon père, nous continuons à nous former aussi bien auprès de notre coopérative que la chambre de l'agriculture. Et aussi, comme notre département de la chambre de l'agriculture, pour voir si de nouvelles solutions apparaissent ou peuvent être technologiquement implémentées sur la ferme. Mais l'observation que nous faisons aujourd'hui est que nous n'avons pas augmenté either our expenses or production costs with the introduction of those biocontrols. We did not need to get new specific equipment. We kept our organization quite simple and we stayed just as efficient and we even got better given that uh, in the case of two biocontrols, we preserved uh, the beneficials that were already on the plot. So what I would like to say to those who are considering using biocontrols today is that it has given us three solutions. The first one, as company manager, we have kept going. We have found alternatives to our production while maintaining an identical production cost with increased efficiency. The second solution is as farmer, it allowed me to produce better while meeting yield targets and reducing the quantity of inputs on my land. And the third solution is as citizen, it allowed me to participate in protecting the environment and reducing our impact on the planet. As um, uh, our member of the European Parliament has uh, said, um, when, when, it, when it gets going by a control, then the European Commission can um, put measures in place, obviously with the support of all member states um, for it to be promoted further. So now we're gonna to move to our second panel, our second group of speakers. Um, let's discuss with them uh, the opportunities for a swift transition to a favorable regulatory climate for biocontrol. Panelists from um, uh, the first session, do stay with us. We're going to have an open debate at the uh, at the end. First, we're going to hear. Um, let's bring our speakers, our panelists, onto the screen. Um, IBMA Executive Director Global Jennifer Lewis is here with us. Océane Chapmorteau, who's responsible for agroecology at Carrefour, the retailer and direct from the French Ministry of Agriculture and Food, uh, Cédric uh, Prévost, who's responsible um, for agroecology and the food transition. So um, our first panel focused on unlocking legal constraints. Now we're gonna get more practical. So how to make biocontrol mainstream. And remember, you can ask your questions um, by the Q&A box uh, in the screen. We have 30 minutes to go for, of the event. So let's get straight to Jennifer. Um, Jennifer, you're executive director of uh, the International Biocontrol Manufacturers Association, um, leading the global sector. What's your perspective? What are the main barriers to biocontrol that must be overcome on the SUD revision? Jennifer. Thank you, Joe, And thank you to all the audience and to the other speakers. Um, and several speakers have in fact said that we need uh, food systems that are both sustainable and resilient um, to continue feeding um, Europe in the future. And uh, this is urgent, both the current crises and, and the pressing concerns of climate change that have been mentioned. Biocontrol is essential to achieving this, um, uh, this this resilient agriculture that, uh, that we're looking for. And moreover, it's actually available now. So we need a, a really urgent transition um, in terms of how we farm. And we heard from Edouard Bouya um, that he's able uh, very effectively and very economically to protect his crops um, from pests and diseases. Um, and to do this, we actually need to speed up our access to biocontrol. And for this three things, we need a definition, 
we need a target, and we need a simplified authorization system. So to separate uh, biocontrol from chemical pesticides, um, we really need to start with this legal definition. And they've, as Denis mentioned in France, have been very successful in, in using a definition and using that to accelerate all aspects of um, biocontrol um, adoption. Um, this separation in Europe would make it easier to measure the reduction in uh, chemical pesticides within the farm to fork goals. And it gives legal clarity and allows us to link to other legislation, making it easier for farmers to deliver the benefits of biocontrol, be that to nature or soil or climate, as Faustine mentioned, um, and, and linking into the eco schemes uh, through the CAP uh, national strategic plans that, uh, that were mentioned by other speakers. And it could also pave the way for simplifying our authorization framework of 1107-2009 when it comes to biocontrol. Um, what is biocontrol? It's just worth mentioning that to, uh, to clarify that for, for anyone who's, who's uh, not sure in the audience. It's, it's the four categories. We look at it as four categories of biocontrol. So the invertebrates, uh, the arthropods and mites that control uh, insect pests um, or diseases, the microbials, that's uh, fungi and bacteria that control or outcompete uh, fungal and bacterial disease in plants or, or even in insects. And then the semiochemicals, so that's the mediato um, that are highly specific pheromones and keramones that alter the behavior of insect pests, often preventing them from mating and multiplying um, so that the larvae, the damage causing larvae are not, uh, are not uh, uh, present. And then finally, the natural substances that are often the botanical extracts but may also be other natural substances such as minerals. And it's important to note that this natural substance group is a wide group and we need that breadth in any definition um, because we need to actually ensure that we maximize the uses covered by biocontrol because by maximizing those, there are more pest and disease uses that farmers have, more pest and disease um, uses are covered and farmers have more tools to control their pests and diseases. And the place for this biocontrol definition is in the Sustainable Use Directive. Then just touching on the second point of targets, um, a definition actually provides the opportunity to put legally binding targets that ensure farmers are supported in their transition to biocontrol. So we need a positive target for biocontrol. And today we have positive targets in farm to fork, for example, for 25% um, of agriculture to be organic farming. And all organic farming uses biocontrol. So to have 25% organic farming, we need 25% biocontrol. Um, and to have biocontrol in conventional farming, then we need a further um, percentage of biocontrol to complement reduction in chemical pesticides. So we could say that we need a target for biocontrol to ensure that we meet these other targets, this 50% reduction, this 25% increase of, um, of organic farming. So we should set ourselves an ambitious positive target for biocontrol um, to help us achieve the other farm to fork targets. And we should be setting a target of 75%. The biocontrol industry is ready to provide tools. The pipelines are full. In Europe, products are stuck in the regulatory system and it can take up to 10 years to reach the market. In other countries, like Brazil or the US, it, it takes two years. And the lack of the regulatory system adapted to biocontrol causes unnecessary costs, delays, and barriers to getting biocontrol to farmers. So let's reduce the uncertainty to farmers who are already committed to the agricultural transition and let's not risk security of supply of biocontrol. So farmers need and have all the biocontrol they need, and that sustainable food companies are able to source what they need in Europe. So to speed up, we need to adapt the biocontrol authorization system in Europe. So to summarize, food security and sustainability go hand in hand. To manage the uncertainty, we need to secure a resilient and sustainable food system. We need to be enable biocontrol with a legal definition and a positive target. 
this is the starting point and we need it in order to give biocontrol the center stage role it should be playing in farm to fork. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Jennifer. That was very informative um, and very clear. Um, we're going to ask now um, directly, we're going to go directly to Océane Chamorteau from the Groupe Carrefour, which is a French food retailer. Um, Océane is responsible for um, uh, agroecology and uh, quality uh, fruits, uh, vegetables. And she's going to talk to us about uh, sustainable food systems and the availability of biologically farmed products. Um, Please share with us uh, how Carrefour is leading in this space. Over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. So to answer your question, indeed, nowadays, uh, the Carrefour Group, uh, specifically since 2018, has launched uh, an action program um, in the food uh, sector, there are different uh, acts, so including one uh, on uh, bi biological uh, farming and one uh, on uh, deleting chemical pesticides. So this is very strong and uh, a very strategic axis. And uh, it's uh, very French because Carrefour is a French business and French enterprise, even though we are present in more than 30 countries, including six countries in Europe. So everything I'm going to describe here, well, we would like to see it developed in all the countries of the Carrefour group. So we implemented a plan in favor of agroecology. That plan is based on four main pillars. One on the preservation of um, soil life, one on the preservation and maintenance of biodiversity, one on um, water and energy consumption, and one very important pillar on um, the suppression of uh, all the chemical pesticides on uh, all crops or most crops, well, it's case by case, depending on the sectors. So that pillar is the one we decided to uh, promote for the consumers because we know that um, that's one of their main worries in France and in Europe. So on that uh, part to reduce um, um, chemical synthetic pesticides, we will go through specs, specs on our um, label products, so uh, Reflet de France and Filière Qualité Carrefour. Those specs are quite uh, um, high, have quite high requirements when, when it comes to production, and for those uh, production requirements, we will ask on a case-by-case -case basis, we will ask our producers to work on uh, stopping the use of uh, all the synthetic pesticides. So either all of them or just a family of them, insecticides or uh, fungicides or uh, other um, specific pesticides, depending on the sector, on the branch. And that goes through the use of uh, um, biocontrol products in or other products. So in our specs, we don't, we won't require the use of uh, this or that control. We will uh, leave that choice to the producers to um, find their technical itinerary journey or uh, the products they will use, but we are really pushing on that. And it's being developed in the other countries of the group, including Belgium, Spain, Romania, Italy, we are also developing agroecology with those countries, and we are also pushing in those facts towards more use of biological organic products or biocontrol products. So yes, in our shops today, there is conventional farming, which we would like to see evolving more towards agroecological practices. There's also organic products, and we are still um, we are we still have a leadership on that and of course the agroecological uh, farming that uh, third voice we talked about during the introduction 
which is gaining traction because uh, in France uh, we produced uh, more than um, 50,000 tons uh, of uh, fruits and vegetables according to those practices. So there's still a lot to do, but uh, we are moving forward. The producers are really motivated and we have the leadership on that topic um, when compared to other um, other businesses. And it has been welcomed by NGOs such as Greenpeace that really challenged us on uh, reducing the use of pesticides. So nowadays we really need to see and okay, there's a sentence I really like. Farming needs time, but indeed, uh, it, unfortunately, it's not uh, the time uh, of the consumers or the um, time of the lawmakers, because unfortunately, we often see that molecules uh, are, uh, are stopped on a regular level or um, yeah, and we need to see alternative solutions for biocontrol on the market to really answer to uh, those technical constraints and uh, bottlenecks and everything that goes with it. So I tried to be as uh, quick as possible. I hope I uh, answered the questions. If not, uh, please do tell me. Um, we're going to go directly to Cédric Prévost. He's uh, the, uh, at the French Ministry of Agriculture and Food. Um, Cédric, um, you're our last uh, speaker, last but not least. It seems like French are part, the French are pioneers in this area, so congratulations to you and your colleagues. Um, so um, before we get to the, the wider discussion, please tell us why is biocontrol a priority for the French government today and what measures are in place to support its deployment? Uh, Cédric, over to you. Bonjour. Merci, Joe. Bonjour à Thank tous. you, Joe. Good afternoon, everybody. I am honored and quite happy to participate in that event on biocontrol. It is a great initiative that allows us to um, give biocontrol all the focus it needs and the attention. We were talking about time, and I think time is quite relevant today when we talk about biocontrol. And from that point of view, for the French government, biocontrol is a priority. It's a priority of the French authorities, and it is because of three conclusions. First one, the products of biocontrol, and it's been said before, and it's not easy to be the last one because many things have been said, very many relevant things. But so the future is in uh, uh, solutions, uh, innovative solutions, and solutions uh, for within the agroecology. So when France started in agroecology, uh, we uh, deemed biocontrol uh, a part of it. And we know that it is an alternative to phytopharmaceutical products and synthetic products, products. And from that standpoint, it allows us to reduce the impacts on the environment, on the health of consumers and farmers, and the impact on the whole uh, chain, food chain for public health. So those uh, innovative solutions, are set in a context where there is a big, uh, big expectations from society to reduce those impacts I just talked about. There's a lot of pressure also in uh, farms. Uh, we need solutions. And on a European level, on a French level, there also has been a reduction of uh, molecules and active substances. We have to say it in order to reduce the risks linked to phytopharmaceutical products. So this reduction leads to a review the strategy of crop production. And it is necessary to avoid leaving farmers without solution. And biocontrol is one of the solutions. A second um, thing I wanted to say, biocontrol um, is uh, mm, at the heart of initiatives, uh, very promising initiatives by businesses, enterprises. And there's a sector in France uh, um, made of startups, of SMEs, that uh, now suggest solutions and do R&D on that sector. That innovation today allows uh, in France, well, that's mm, the conclusion we drew in December last year. It, and so 54% of users today are covered by at least one biocontrol solution. So this is mm, very good. So that's one of the targets that we established in the 
biocontrol strategy, we wanted that at the, on the 1st of uh, January 2022, at least 50% of uh, the um, situations are covered by a biocontrol situation. And third observation is that it's a sector that needs support. It needs support because using biocontrol solutions is not equivalent to using a classical molecule, um, a, a typical phytopharmaceutical product. It doesn't have the same efficiency, the same action mode. Using biocontrol needs to um, imply a reflection, a systemic reflection on the whole farm. And uh, it needs to be uh, used hand in hand with other solutions. And most of all, it has to be thought out case by case, adapted to uh, the climate context and uh, the crops. So on that standpoint, accompanying um, the process has to be made first through farmers. They have to be made aware. We have to raise their awareness to biocontrol. And the video we saw earlier was really important because the farmer who testified, said that he was still training himself and he was always updating his skills and his knowledge on biocontrol solutions. So from that standpoint, one of the objectives is to bring on farms uh, biocontrol solutions that will be easy to implement for farmers. That's really important. And to get there, there's that leverage that need to accelerate research and innovation. And it has been said before me, and uh, it has been said really well during the first panel, we also need to underline the regulation, the adaptation of regulation and of the guidelines for assessment evaluations to take into account the specificities of biocontrol. So um, if we go, the, the French authorities uh, from that uh, observation, put in place uh, several actions. Mm, so it has been said already by Denis Langevial, I won't uh, go dwell on it, but we very early on, we, we thought about a definition, implementing a definition, and it was implemented in uh, the regulatory framework in 2014. But the definition is not the end of a process, it's the very beginning. So we start from the definition, and there on, we develop a strategy and other regulations that can help develop that sector. A recent development, for example, we took a decree, we uh, adopted a decree in January 2022, a few months ago, to define the criterion that biocontrol products have to fill, biocontrol products who are considered mm, not worrying less worrying for health and environment. So we went one step further to support the sector and help it develop. So when it comes to regulation, the law of 2018 is very important because it's uh, implemented in the law, uh, the importance to have a national strategy for biocontrol for its development. That national strategy has been implemented in November 2020, and it relies on four pillars. First of all, the support to research and innovation. Second, the regulatory aspect uh, with uh, the need to um, ease things and make it more uh, understandable. Uh, third one, support to enterprises. And fourth one, to promote biocontrol at European level. And I think that we are meeting that target specifically during this event. So a few examples. In the framework of the recovery plan of in France, we had a farming part. And in that farming part, um, promotion of uh, agroecology and biocontrol. Two measures. First one, we funded um, initiatives for uh, the enterprises uh, involved in biocontrol to help them identify all the regulatory leverages and constraints that they had to uh, develop their business plan. Second action that was implemented, to it was to implement businesses for the in their business plan, in their project, to help uh, make that uh, business network uh, bigger and stronger. So once again, it's young enterprises and uh, small ones. So for the future, we implemented a plan, uh, France 2030, 
And we have a project, uh, the Big Biocontrol Challenge, that's the name. Uh, we are finalizing it now. And the goal of that project is to give a new momentum to research with public and private partnerships dedicated to biocontrol. So as you see, there is an action from the French authorities that um, in, is acting uh, on regulatory aspects, but also on the implementation of uh, support mechanisms on all the leverages I already mentioned. So today those mechanisms are implemented and there's also a governance on them. We talk about them, they are discussed within uh, the, the discussions we have with all the stakeholders and the representatives from farmers and uh, unions, but also representatives from research and NGOs. So the idea is to have as much debate as possible on that topic. And you see it in France, we have an ambition, the ambition to be an active actor on biocontrol. And we want to share that ambition at European level because mutualizing the efforts at European level will allow us to have a stronger and more innovative continent in the biocontrol sector. Thank you very much. We're gonna go, we have uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, I feel there's so much to share. We could continue all day uh, or at least have, have a more regular set of events to keep everybody up to date on this. Um, it's a fascinating topic. Um, I have a question here that we of through social media, which I'm gonna to put to Jennifer. I mean, we talked about Europe, but what about worldwide? Um, Jennifer um, from the International Biocontrol Manufacturers Association, have other countries or regions made the transition to biocontrol? I mean, how is Europe uh, doing? Um, can you share with us a concrete example of how this works in practice? Sure, thanks, Joe. Um, yes, I mean, I think if it was to pick out, uh, obviously, France is a leader in, in Europe in this, and, and there are other countries of, that are very strong. If we're looking at other areas, then I would say Brazil is extremely strong in biocontrol and uh, has, has, is using biocontrol a lot outdoors. So in, in large acres of, of soybeans, um, and they're being often, we're using a combination of microbial um, uh, products actually applied, but also using uh, in, invertebrates. So, and often these are applied through uh, through drones. So you've got these tiny little eggs of uh, of insects, and so of course they're very very light. And a, one drone can do multiple uh, hectares just by just applying the the eggs of of the insects that uh, um, that control uh, the beneficial insects that control the the, the pest insects. So we're seeing some very interesting innovation. Um, combining digital technology with uh, with basic biocontrol um, and being able to then extend the area that it's used in hugely. Thank you. That's a really concrete example. Good. So that puts it into perspective. I want to come back uh, to follow up with Ocean. Um, Ocean, what do you think more can be done by food chain actors, uh, retailers, manufacturers, others to support uh, biocontrol? Ocean. So, today, what we're trying to do is communicate mainly. So, we are the last element of the chain for the consumer. The word biocontrol bio here is still a bit too complex, too scientific for the consumer. We need to try to uh, mainstream it. We have a huge role to play in education and uh, pedagogy. Uh, for consumers when it comes to uh, the use of those biocontrol products. So th it goes through communication and uh, communication on catalogs and um, social networks on uh, ads on TV. And we are trying to train as much as possible the teams uh, in the shops because our colleagues are the first one in contact with clients on a day-to-day -day basis. So it goes through um, um, ads uh, in the, the shop and videos in the shop, um, maybe try and bring the producers to meet directly the clients to explain their production method, what they do, etc. So mainly goes through pedagogy explaining and uh, uh, a meeting between the client, the shop, and the producers. To make sure that all of consumers um, can come on board and be part of this, this uh, transition. 
Um, we are running out of time. I feel there's lots of questions we could put um, to all of you, Faustine and Denise. Sorry, we didn't get to ask you a different question. Um, and also to Cédric. Um, I feel we should all get back together and continue this conversation. Um, what I would like to say now, um, in the interest of time, I'm sure everybody's pretty hungry unless they didn't eat before, is to thank you so much to our guest speakers, um, especially from France for sharing your pioneering work on biocontrol and to our Brussels friends for your invaluable contributions. So thank you to MEP Jeremy de Serlet, our European Commissioner, it's European, not Commissioner, you've been promoted, European Commission, DG Sante, Director Mrs. Um, Maria Pilar Aguad, French Ministry of Agriculture, Cédric Provost, thank you. From Carpo Oceana, Chat Morteau, thank you. To former Edouard Biat and to Law Professor Grimont Pré, and to our hosts, thank you to you for putting this event together. IBMA uh, Secretary General France, Denis Langage Vial, um, Institute for European Environment Policy. Uh, uh, Faustine Bas de Fosse and um, IBMA Global, Jennifer Lewis. Thank you again, speakers, and thank you, audience from us all. Goodbye.